near was me, you still came. Oh, well, that's, that's good. Thank you. I need an audience. Okay, Second Kings chapter 6. Um, this one's a little bit of a strange one, but you probably think they're all strange. You're going to be doing... I, I need you to be a major part of this talk, and you'll see why in a minute. So Second Kings chapter 6. Um, this year we're going to, in our area, um, my illustrious leader, the famous Brendan, decided to uh, choose a, adopt a theme for the entire year. And the theme involves the scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, which is pray without ceasing. So there's a real emphasis on prayer, and that's going to be developed through the whole year. But so this is, uh, the title of this is Pray for Your Goldfish. And what, pray for your goldfish. All right. So, Second Kings, chapter 6. We'll set up the scene. Are you giving me a mean look, Pastor Jock? You just don't know what I'm going to do, do you? <laughs> All right. Verse... Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. It's too small, there's too many of us, we need to build a bigger barn, basically. Let's go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, some wood. Let us make a place there where we may dwell. And they answered, and he said, Well, off you go, go ye. Um, verse 3, And one said, Be content. I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And so they went. And so they're basically going to a different place and they're going to build stuff because where they live is too small for them. So they're going to build a bigger thing. So they're going to use wood and implements of destruction. And uh, verse 4, so he went with them and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood, which is how you start. But alas, tragedy struck. This is one of my favourite passages of scripture, by the way. Um, verse 5. And as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now, before you read on, what Elijah said was, Bad luck, pal. Or he said, You better start diving. Or he said, what's your problem? It's just an axe. Or he said, nah, it's inconsequential. Or well, what did he do? He did something amazing. Verse 6, and the man of God said, where fell it? Where did it fall? In the river. So obviously it's in the river. It's, he can't dive for it. He doesn't know where it is. Maybe the river's murky. He's not a good diver. He can't find it. It's beyond salvation, the axe head. Where fell it? And he showed him the place. So what does Elisha do? Does he wave his arm around the place and call down the power of God in an amazing light show? Or anything like that? No. He does something really weird. And he cut down a stick. What with? Hasn't got an axe. That's, anyway, he cuts down a stick. He ripped it down off the tree and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and he took it. So he grabbed a stick, he chucked it in the water, and this axe head floated. Who would think to do that? None of you. I wouldn't. But Elisha, who's well versed in the art of stick chucking, <laughs> thought, aha, I can use my stick chucking expertise. So, it's with great sadness that I regret to inform you that since the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended and we received the new salvation method, stick chucking is no longer available to us to engage the power of God. It's been replaced by praying. So, no more stick chucking, praying. 
or hankies. You can read that up, read that in Acts 19 if you want to have a look at that. So the whole purpose of today is for you to please join me and to share with us strange little testimonies that you would not normally share with people. Now, what I mean by that, it's still the power of God, but if you shared it with someone, they'd go, oh, that's just a coincidence. It was going to happen anyway. It's, no, it's not like someone had medical evidence they were dying of cancer, and the next day they've got medical evidence that the cancer disappeared overnight. Now, that's what we would then, that's what we would normally get out of our back pocket and say, see, look, God heals, or God did A, B, C, D. All right? But what I would want you to share with me today is those little weird things that you think, oh, I can't tell anyone this, but you know it's a miracle because you prayed about it and it came to pass. I'm going to kick the ball off and I wish that people, once you've, you can, want, you've already put your hand up, Rob. You've got one. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Someone that says, I've got one. All right, now I'm going to tell you my story. I've got two stories, but I'll use one of them. So... I was driving back from Adelaide um, to Wyala. I was 30 kilometres out of Wyala and I was driving a Volkswagen combi van, which have got a fantastic reputation for the strength of their headlights. Not. <laughs> now, from about Port Piri to where I got to, I was 30 kilometres out. It was quarter to midnight. And I've got my family in the car. Three little kids, wife, me. And from about Port Piri, I started to see that the lights were starting to go dimmer. <laughs> but I just kept going and said, nah, that's nah, all right, no worries. This is what, by, oh, by the way, ladies, this talk is not for you because you are amazing prayer people. This is for the blokes. Blokes are useless because we try and fix everything. We never ever pray about it. All right? So... I'm driving, I got to Port Augusta, I could have had it checked, but no, we'll keep going. And I got out of Port Augusta and I got to the point where I couldn't see a thing at all. So here I am driving at night under the full moon, because you can do that as a bloke, without any headlights at all. I turned, I then, my, my motor started to miss a beat. That means it's getting no, the battery's draining. Yes, mechanic types are telling me yeah, that's true. So. I'm starting to lose all of my electrical energy. I've got nothing left. I turned the radio off, I turned the heater off, I turned every electrical thing in my whole mind off in the car. And I'm driving along and it's going and then it went and I'm, I'm, I'm hurtling along at about 100 kilometres an hour and I thought, that's not good. So I steered off and safely parked and there I was, quarter to 12, 30 kilometres, I can see Wyala, 30, 30 kilometres out from Wyala and just stuck. No cars, what am I going to do? So I thought, OK, I'll just let it have a rest, as you do. No electrical principles involved, you let it have a rest. Turn the key off, pull the key out just in case, you know. <laughs> That's magic. Put the key back in, turned it. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Couldn't even turn on an internal light. Nothing. Just clunk, 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 clunk. Nothing. Oh, this, yuck. All right, what am I going to do? Pray about it. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to pray for my goldfish. That's what the title of the talk is. I'm going to pray for my, I'm going to pray for this car. I'm going to pray for this car. I know it sounds weird, but I'm going to do it. Because I've got no other, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to ring RIA or anything like that. I'm going to pray for the car. So for five minutes inside the road, prayed. And you know that moment? <laughs> I put the key in and I turned the key on and it went. <laughs> and this thing, I tell you not, exploded into life. It was most fantastic. I wish you could be there with me. It was stunning. The lights burned into the sides of the hills. They were so, so powerful. And I turned on everything, the radio, the air conditioner, everything. And I sailed down the road. It's fantastic. Yes! Look at this. What an amazing miracle. I was going to tell everyone. And then got in, 
chuffed as anything. Wow, check me out. Look at me. Look what I did. I prayed. <laughs> got in, got to my house, and as I'm approaching my house, I mounted the curb because I'm a bad driver. So I mounted the curb and stalled the car, as you do, because I was in low gear and I stalled the car. I thought, no problems. I'll just start the car and I'll... What are you nodding your heads for? <laughs> you know what's going to happen, hey? I turned the key and guess what? Nothing. Not a thing. Zip. Nada. It was dead. And when the guy came out the next day, he said, this is the deadest battery I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> and I told him the story. He said, no, it's not possible. That's my pray for the goldfish story. Who's got one? Rob. It's got to be short because I'm going to kick you off. I've actually got one more scripture to share, two scriptures to share with people, so I'll kick you off. No, up here, mate, up here. Who's next? Who's next? Pastor Jock, who's where? Yep, oh, yeah, or uh, five, three minutes? Yeah. Brendan? Yes? Yes. All right, can you come up this way, please? Liz? Yeah, all right. Um, mine, we were at Murray, on the Murray, Saint and Murray Bridge down that way. Um, anyway, I lost my glasses in the water and if anyone knows what the Murray's like, you can't see one foot in front of you. And um, we'd gone away, we were on holidays. I didn't have a spare pair of, gl pair of glasses and they fell off my head, went in the water and I thought, great. I spent a bit of time and I thought, I'm not going to find these. So I just thought, all right, I'll just have some prayer. Had some prayer, moved my foot, and I felt this thing under my foot. So I squished around a bit, and I thought, oh, it might be, because you don't know if it's a branch or whatever it is. I just thought, had some prayer, and then I just reached down, and sure enough, I picked up my glasses. But I moved a metre or so away to where I thought it might have been. But, yeah, praise the Lord, I found them. But That's enough. That's it. Fantastic. Next. Oh, you don't clap golf stories. <laughs> yeah, look, I'd probably been in the Lord maybe four weeks if I was lucky. And um, there's a couple of guys that had come back to the fellowship and along at the same time as me. We were out, went out for a ski one, one afternoon on the water and we'd spent an hour trying to start the boat. Beautiful day. All we wanted was to ski and the boat was, it was dead. And it didn't start, it was nothing on. And one of the other guys just turns around blankly and sort of looks, he goes, oh, Mark 16 says you lay hands on the sick. It doesn't say it has to be a person. So the four of us laid hands on the boat, prayed in the spirit for the boat to be healed. We, st we went to start it again and it started instantly. That's a goldfish moment. Young man, substantially thinner, um, all my salary at the time was going elsewhere except to me. And day before payday, I had a choice. I had five dollars, put fuel in the car so I could get to work the next day, or get some food. Uh, so I did the fuel. And uh, Karen's going to kill me. Uh, and um, anyway, I said, well, Lord, you're just going to have to sustain me because I didn't build up the re reserves like I had now. Um, but um, I rocked up home, and there's this bag hanging on the door. And inside there were these delicious pastries and uh, chicken croissants with garlic buttery sauce thing and mushrooms in them and stuff like that. And being a guy, they could have been full of rat poison, but I knocked them off anyway. <laughs> and they're fantastic. I thought afterwards, well, who would have done that? And apparently, I process of elimination, Karen was a qualified chef. I phoned her and said, did you do that? And she said, the Lord put it in her mind that there was a brother that was starving. And I sort of prayed that, oh, Lord, just make me not starve tonight. Anyway, we all know it's entrapment, but a good story. And, uh, yeah, Lord did that for me. Uh, I have two. Uh, one is um, when the kids were really little and you had things like videos that you used to, you know, hire from the shop. Anyway, they were late and I had to take them back. Uh, Jeff was away at the time and uh, 
I forgot about doing it and I was in my pyjamas, the kids were in their pyjamas, I threw them in the car, went to drop them off, dropped them off, on the way home the car ran out of petrol. And I was like, I'm not going to get out of the side of the road in my pyjamas, that's just not going to happen Lord. So I told the kids to start praying and uh, from Hallett Cove to our place, which is probably a few kilometres away, that car made it and it conked out just as I got in the driveway. So that was definitely a good moment. The other one was we were very uh, not very rich at the time and our fridge that we had conked out and it had all of our food in it and uh, Jeff and I just thought, well, you know, we can't afford to go and buy a new fridge so we laid hands on it and uh, that fridge kept on going and it's, uh, we went down to camp and uh, we bought a new fridge when we could afford it but the Lord just kept that going until we could afford to buy a new one. So, praise the Lord. You know, if this continues, mechanics and fridge people are going to be done out of jobs. I've got two also. First of all, um, I used to work for the post office, so I was a postie, and I decided I'd better myself. And uh, in the post office in those days, you, if you wanted to maybe get to the dizzy heights of a postmaster, you had to become what was called a postal clerk. And you had to go to a school for six months. You had to learn to type because of sending telegrams and all of that. Anyhow, when I decided to do that, I sat for the, uh, for the course and they only wanted about 36 people. But 400 people sat for the course. And a lot of them were school leavers, straight from school. And... Um, if you got over four, if you're in the 300 above the first 100, you failed. But if you're in the first 100, well, then you at least pass. But they only wanted 36. So, of course, I started from number one, who was the bright, brightest out of the 400. And uh, I had been in the post office, resigned, gone to Hobart, resigned, come back and got employed again. And somehow or other, I slipped through the radar on joining the union. I didn't really want to be in the union. Other times, they forced you to be in. Anyway, I wasn't in the union. And um, for about two or three weeks before this course started, I would ring up now and again to see what hope I had. And, oh, look, Mr Duncan, we're up to number four, or we're up to number ten. And what, what number are you? Oh, you're number 72. OK, so, anyhow, this went on until about a bit over a week before the course started and uh, the guy did the well Mr Duncan let's look at this we're up to number 30 by now and you're number 72 and we only want another you know so many and I said well look I'll, I'll ring every day because nobody had telephone hard to imagine that night when I say no only businesses had telephone rich people so when people are put on their resume to get this job, they, you couldn't contact them by telephone. It was either by telegraph, telegram, or by post. That was it. Or you drove to somebody's house. Anyhow, about a week before, uh, when he was sort of saying, oh, Mr Duncan, um, I said, well, I was in the post office, there was a phone there, I said, look, I'll just ring you every day and, you know, and... Soon he, he said, all right, so on Monday of the week, starting on Thursday, all the posties went out on strike. Now, I was a postie, but I wasn't in the union. And my, my boss, he was also not in it. My head, the head post, he said, if we go on strike, we'll get, we'll get the sack. So we've got to go to work. So here I am at the Croydon Post Office with hardly any letters to deliver, a few that came in through the front uh, letterbox. So anyhow, they lost all contact through, uh, through writing a letter to people. And then on the Tuesday, uh, all the drivers went out on strike. So no mail was going anywhere. And then on the Wednesday, the day before the course started, all the telegram boys went out on strike. They had to go from about number 32 to number 72. And I got in. I think God changed the whole structure of Adelaide just so that that impossible situation come. So I got the well, Mr Duncan, in the end, the Lord. And of course I was praying about it the whole time. Now the other one was going to the rally in Melbourne, another car one. Uh, going to the rally in Melbourne and we had a little old Morris Minor van we were, like most, we were totally broke in those days and we had this old little old printer's van and I'd put a sort of a bench in the back of it with a uh, the mattress and our three little girls were in the back with us and we uh, set off at 
when work stopped as a posty again on a Friday night before the rally and we're heading off for, for Melbourne and we get just south of Tail and Bend and we're doing an incredible speed, maybe 40 miles an hour, 80k would be maximum, I think. And there are little girls in the back. And I remember one of them said to me years later, the only time in our life we ever worried was now and again you would say, oh, no. Now, we wouldn't have a clue what that was. We all knew something was wrong. Well, now, just south of Tail and Bend, right on dusk, we had an oh, no mo moment. The motor just cut dead. So to keep, try to keep the motor going, with manual gear, of course, again, keeping the mo momentum of the car, keeping it going. And anyhow, when it finally stopped, I thought, wow, just totally, I didn't hear a bang, like the big end didn't go or anything like that, or the gearbox hadn't blown up. It just stopped. And I thought, uh, straight away, it's got to either be one or two things, it's got to be electrical or it's got to be petrol, can't be anything else. And I go to jump out and Helen grabs and she says, no, we're going to pray about it first. And I'm thinking, no, I just want to get out there and find out. So anyhow, we have some prayer about it and I get out and I lift the bonnet. So I'm not much of a mechanic, but I've got a spark plug out and you can put it on the block and the old handle, it had a handle on the front. and turn the motor and there was a little spark. So I knew it wasn't that. And then I remember when, when, the, uh, when, the, when the petrol, uh, when it was going, there was a little tick-tick sound from the petrol pump. It's a very old-fashioned car, this. And uh, there was no little tick-tick-tick. And I thought, it's the petrol pump. I knew nothing about petrol pumps. So I got a few tools and I started, and petrol started going everywhere, all over the top of the engine, which was hot. And I put it all back together. And then I dropped a teeny little, one of the little bolty things was holding it together and I knew it had leaked like I said but I'm down on the ground with my eyes trying to right on dust and I found it a bit like the glasses a minute ago and I put it all back together and there it is and then I got my spanner I went like Moses I went bang and I hit it and it roared back into life <laughs> and uh, we went to Geelong I think it was Geelong or something we were going oh, it was Christmas camp well, it was Geelong and when I got there they said you, there's some little points in there and they had stuck. I had no idea, but that bang released it. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. You'll have to ask Simon for his goldfish moment. I'm r running out of time rapidly. Thank you for those things. I actually do want to drive home a point, if I may. Philippians chapter 4. <laughs> now that you've heard those, you've probably got one. I'd like you to share them with your brothers and sisters. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says here, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, we would normally, when, we, when someone preaches on this verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it's talking about being, not being anxious, Oh, not being worried, not being concerned. You know, because when th big things come upon us, we get really concerned and worried. And so we stress out about it and we get all upset. And so normally we would look at this verse and say, don't be anxious, don't be upset, uh, but just put it to prayer. I'd like to just put a just slightly different slant on this and is not about don't be concerned going to switch a couple of words, but don't concern yourself, i.e. don't categorise this. What we do in our minds as people is that we say, oh, this problem has turned up. I don't need to bother God with this one. I can fix it. <laughs> right? I can fix it or I can deal with it or it won't take long or A, B, C, D. And so we have, I'm not going to bother God with this one, or it's not really worthy of God's attention. It's just our thinking, right? So why don't we just chuck a stick at it, like Elisha did? And the whole idea is to develop an instinct of prayerfulness. You develop an instinct of prayerfulness which is immediate, decisive, and direct. So when a situation turns up, instead of categorising, thinking, looking at all the options like I do, because I don't want to ring my wife 
when things happen because the first thing she says to me is, have you prayed about it? <laughs> and I say, no. <laughs> Why not? Because, and there is no reason. So the whole idea of this is you need to be, we need to be, gentlemen, maybe some of the ladies, we need to immediately think about prayer. Have you ever tried to pray in your head? In tongues? Very hard, almost impossible. You need the breath that God gave you right at the beginning to be coming out of your lungs to be changed into tongues. It's a weird thing. It's amazing. Straight away, pray in tongues. Pray in the spirit. Five seconds, five minutes. doesn't matter. It's the attitude. I'm going to pray for my goldfish. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew, sorry, Mark Hardy, who used to work with, or was a brother that came to the Lord in Moella, he was a young trades assistant in the pellet plant. And the pellet plant has got these massive machines which are held together with these huge bolts and nuts, big nuts, not like a little nut like this, but massive nuts like this, about that big. And what they do is they put a thing called a slogger on it. And it's a spanner which fits exactly on the nut and it's got this very small little stubby end on it and guys get 16 foot, 16 pound sledgehammers and they whack these things with all of their strength because in the environment in which it is, these nuts seize up. They'd been whacking away at this one nut all morning, him and the tradespeople. There was about three or four of them. They got to Smoko and they said, we've had enough, I'm going to go and have Smoko. So they off, went off to Smoko. Mark Hardy had just received the Holy Spirit and he laid hands on the nut. <laughs> and he put his hand on the nut and he said, whatever he said, please release or stop, you know, stop, stop being obstinate or whatever. Please loosen. And guess what he did? <laughs> and then he went and said, here's the nut. <laughs> How'd you do that? Prayed about it. Chung! They all disappeared. <laughs> they all disappeared. Matthew chapter 21. There are more. Verse 21. We finish. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, if you have a faithful habit of putting things to prayer, and doubt not. You shall not only do this which is done to this fig tree, but it also, also if you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. So, please, pray for your combi. Pray for your nut. Pray for your cat. Pray for your dog. Pray for your windscreen. Pray for your grass. Ben's mum's testimony, amazing. Pray for a car park in a busy shopping centre. Pray for the traffic lights to change. Pray to find money in your jeans. Pray for your goldfish. You know why? Because one day your goldfish might turn into a mountain and you need to have the habit of praying to get rid of it. Amen? It's prayer time.